Wood as H.D. Woodson's girls basketball coach, he led the Warriors to seven consecutive DCIAA championships, three D.C. City titles, and a winning streak that reached 98. Joining me now is legendary head coach Frank Oliver Jr. Coach, coach, what's up, man? Good to hear from you. How's everything? Everything's doing well, Chris. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, no doubt, man. I appreciate you coming through, bro. It's always good to talk to you when I get the chance to. So, so what you been up to, man? What you up to these days, my friend? I know you're staying busy and all that stuff. Well, yes, yes. Always staying busy. You know, uh, I'm still coaching. I'm, I'm now currently the head coach at Mission McNamara High School uh, in Forestville, Maryland. And uh, this, I just completed my eighth year there. Uh, well, I'm, at, I'm, this, I'm currently in my eighth year uh, at Bishop McNamara. And we're coming off a championship last last year in 2020. Um, being the WCAC champions as well as, uh, you know, being nationally ranked uh, seventh in the country uh, in ESPN and Max Preps and being finishing number one in the Washington Post. Uh, we had McDonald's, another back-to-back -back McDonald's All-American, Jordan Brand All-Americans. And um, we had five seniors go Division One last year, and they're currently two in the SEC, two in the ACC, uh, one in the, the uh, Northeast Conference. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're excited about what we're doing at Bishop McNamara. I'm, I'm I'm doing my passion. I'm, I'm coaching. It's what I love to do, working with young people and uh, helping them reach their dreams and goals. Uh, yeah, man, you are my friend. Very, very, very good at that. Use a coach and use a coach and somebody, man. All right, so to start, man, I want to talk about, I want to go back in the day, you know, like, I mean, if you can call it like 2003, 2004, back in the day. Um, but um, I want to go back and just talk about how you ended up coaching at HD. Um, Cause I know at the time you were coaching in middle school, um, so mm -hmm. what led to you, you know, getting an HD job? All right, well, I was coaching at Francis Junior High School, Twenty Fourth and N Street. Uh, my mother was athletic director there. Uh, it was actually my second year. The first year I was an assistant, uh, helping out uh, after I got home from college and overseas, and uh, I decided to stay and coach a team. I, I really enjoyed the experience working with the young ladies, and uh, they asked me to stay. You know, they begged me to stay. And I said, you know what? I can get my career started later or now. I said, let's get it started now. You know, I decided to stay and they, they convinced me to stay. And uh, Tia Bell was one of those young ladies that came into the program. Uh, yeah, Tia Bell, Patrice Johnson came into the program. And a young lady by the name of Carlita Green, who was a sixth grader at Garrison Elementary, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and she was coming into Francis. That was her neighborhood school. And um, so we had, you know, the makings of something special right there. And we had an outstanding year. We actually, you know, went undefeated that year. Won Francis Junior High School's first ever championship in basketball, oh, wow. uh, which was amazing because previous to that, you know, they were kind of, kind of at the bottom of the of the, of the rankings, so to speak. Uh, Jefferson and Deal were always winning, and uh, so we kind of broke up that party, and uh, we had a successful year. And um, my partner, I was teaching at Banneker uh, Senior High School. It was my first year teaching full time. In DC Public Schools, and I was teaching at Banneker Senior High School, and uh, my partner in teaching health and physical education was McClinton Brown, who was a legendary DC coach in his own right. right. Uh, one, you know, he was the only one that I knew of that beat Coach Head um, before, so he was good friends with Coach Head, mm -hmm. and Coach Head actually called him during lunch. We were eating lunch one day, and he called him and he said, "You know, hey, um, you know, I'm looking for a coach. You know, I'm going to retire, and I haven't really let anybody know. I haven't let the paper know or anybody know." And Coach, he, had, he named some guys that he was thinking about calling to replace him. And Coach Brown said, no, I have somebody for you that's right here sitting eating lunch with me. You need to check him out. You know, his team is going to be in the championship. It's going to be at Woodson, um, you know, coming up. And Coach Hayden was like, okay, I'm going to check him out. You know, I have to go. You know, I'll be out of town that weekend. But, you know, I'll definitely get the report and we'll go from there. And, and, that, and that was, you know, that was the way that ball got rolling, you know, as far as, you know, getting the interview at H.D. Woodson. Um, and I also looked at uh, Bishop McNamara because Coach Mike Bozeman at the time was top coach and one of the top coaches in the area. Mm -hmm. He was leaving to go to college. I knew the the, the principal. Uh, he was my counselor at DeMatha. And so I called him, yeah. you know. Yeah. So and then also, you know, Tia Bell. Tia Bell was a, was a star young lady and every school wanted her. Um, she, uh, you know, Interviewed a lot of schools, shadowed a lot of schools in the WCAC. And, um, yeah, she just – she told me. She was like, Coach, you know, I'm, I'm, they were all great visits, but, you know, I don't want to play for anybody other than you. And I was kind of like, well, that's that's nice, but I don't have – I have never coached in high school, and I don't have a high school job right now. This is my first year being the head coach at Francis. 
Mm-hmm. And we had a great year, but I said she was a ninth grader. And I was like, she was the only ninth grader on the team. And I was like, you know, you got to go to high school. Right. And so she was just, you know, just really distraught about it. And I, you know, I thought about it and I said, you know what, I, I can do it. She kind of gave me the confidence to even just think about it, the, the thought, you know, to put the thought in my mind and um, which I knew I would do it eventually, but that was the, the very next year. And so, yeah. So that me with that confidence. First it doesn't. Year, how you go right to high school? One year. Yeah, one year. And 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 I and I kind of figured that, but I had confidence in myself, you know, and I knew um, that I had a, a great background. I knew that I had great mentors and teachers and, um, you know, with my mother being the main one, um, but then also putting me in front of people like Coach Coach Wooten, um, having a chance to go to Europe and play. And I, I just had been exposed to a lot of different things. So I just knew that I was ready. And even though my experience didn't show it, I knew that I, I had the confidence in myself. And uh, with what I did at Francis and then with Tia saying, you know, coach, you know, I don't want to play for anybody else. That kind of, I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it for her. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this for her. You know, she's such a special young lady. When I say um, just talented, gifted, a very intelligent, um, just, she was different, you know? And I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Cause I was doing whatever I could to get her into any school, whether it be mailing off applications, uh, setting up shadow visits, talking to coaches in the WCAC, um, and DCIAA, you know, everybody wanted her from everybody in DCIAA and WCAC. So I was really trying to get her in a good situation. And um, when she said that, and she was really serious about it. At first, I thought she was joking, but then she was really serious. And I saw her mood change. And I was like, you know what? I, I have to do something. I have to at least try. Yeah. And that's when I went ahead and um, I had an interview set up for McNamara on a, on a Thursday in the spring. Uh, after we won that championship, and then I had an interview set up at H.G. Woodson for the very next day on a Friday. So, um, you know, McNamara, I, I, the interview went well. Uh, but, the, you know, they said you kind of, you know, need some experience. We want you to be an assistant coach under, you know, the coach that we're going to promote, the assistant coach that we're going to promote him. And we want you to – you can assist him, you know. And I was like, okay, you know, I'll get back with you guys. You know, I have another interview tomorrow. And so – Went to H.T. Woodson the next day, and my interview was with Coach Hedden. It was all set up, and, you know, I walk in, and he's, you know, he's kind of smiling, and he's like, hey, you know, introduce himself. And we had kind of talked a little bit on the phone, but, um, and he, you know, he takes out all his keys, and he starts showing me around the building, you know, and he, he's like, this is, this is, you know, the key to the gym, and this is the key to this room, and this is the office, and this is where the uniforms are, and let me take you up to the seventh floor. Let me take you to the to the, the cosmetology school. Let me take you uh-huh. to the where the pool was. So he started <laughs> taking me around the school, and um, you know, he was like, "Hey, are you ready?" You know, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I guess I am." What an interview! You know? <laughs> so, so it was more. It's more. It was. It, it was le- more or less of it. I think he had already made up his mind. You know, right. I think he, a coach like that, a legendary coach like Coach Hedden, does his homework, and he took a chance on me. You know, and he, I guess he, he felt strong enough to give me an opportunity. And I appreciate him to this very day for that, yeah. you know, because he gave me a chance as a young and coach, it, like you said, first year. And it's something else that, um, mm-hmm. well, before I, before I go, before I go there, I love that story of that interview where he takes you around the school and this is in the, in the old HD where, yeah. did the elevators work? At that the time? tower of power. Yeah, they did. They did. They did. Elevators they did. did work. Yeah. And the escalators. Really? Yeah, escalators and elevators like, were working, you know, some somewhat. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it was definitely, yeah. They work, they work. I I I went on I've been on the elevator several times. I was on the escalator before. That's yeah, I've been up to the to the top, you know. But I love that I love that story, man. Cause um, like you said, a a legendary coach like Bob Hedden is gonna do his homework. And pretty much he was kind of from from what I got from it, he'd already say, All right, this is the guy who's gonna who's gonna be my my um my successor. And let me show him around, let him know everything you need to know, and just hand him the keys to the Ferrari. Yeah, it was it was a completely different interview from the one at Bishop McNamara. I'm sure. Where the one at Bishop McNamara was in more of a boardroom. You know, you're meeting, you know, you have people sitting there looking at you, asking you questions, and asking you what your coaching philosophy is. And, you know, let me see your practice plans and things like that. And uh, even though I was prepared for that, you know, I had my resume submitted to both places. But, yeah, Coach Hedden definitely, he did his interview a, a lot different, you know, and it was, he almost, had made it, you know, had knew it was almost, it was up to me. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely jumped at it right away, you know, being 24 years old, 25 years old, you know, I jumped right at it. And, um, you know, I haven't looked back since. No doubt about it. 
And 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 another thing, um, speaking to Coach Head and you know, especially you being his successor and you know, after that, since that day, you know, especially in the early part um, of of your time at HD. Coach Hedden would still, you know, come to your practices and stuff like that and, and yeah. kind of, you know, put his, you know, you know, two to two, you know, two and ten cents in um, to oh, yeah. have you asked him and stuff like that. So kind of speak about how Hedden, you know, continued to, you know, help out the program during your time. No, well, I, he was actually, I think, the athletic director when I was hired. Mm. And I think he was he was getting ready. He had retired from the Native students. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he had retired from teaching prior to that. He retired from football. He had hired Greg Fuller. Uh, a few years prior, uh, who came from Elliott um, to to be the football coach, and obviously he did an outstanding job to this very day. Yeah. And um, and then he, you know, he brought me in, and I think he was still the athletic director, so he was still around. And me being just the student of the game that I am, I, I invited him to practice. You know, I asked him for advice because I really wanted to know anybody. Anytime you're you're around somebody who's had that type of success and the job that you're taking. It would make sense that they're still available to pick their brain and to try to learn as much as you possibly could, you know, so that you can be successful. Because obviously what he did worked and I still have to be myself, but I wanted to learn what worked for him so that I can incorporate that into what I already knew and into my style. And um, so I asked him, you know, I would go to his house. You know, he invited me to his house. I would go to his house. I've been to his house several times mm-hmm. uh, where we would just sit and talk. I've gone through, I've asked for film. So I studied film from, um, you know, 2001 to 2000, 99, 98. I had, he had stacks of tapes and I'm a film guy. So I I watched every single film when they played Anacostia in 98. Yeah. I watched, you know, Dunbar in 2001. I watched, you know, I had all the film. The he had thing. these tapes. Yeah, that's that's when it was VHS, and he had these special made tapes. They were, they were uh, red and green. Oh wow! And they had oh HD no, Woodson kidding! Oh, that's yeah, tight. That's they tight. were red and gray, and he had the stick, the HD Woodson sticker on it. The, the Warrior was on it, Dang, that's and, tight. He, and he had the the score, the place, the time, the date, everything on it. And I watched every single game, and I talked to him about his philosophy. How did he teach certain things? And then I invited him into practice. To I say, well, coach, you know, what was your press breaker? And what was just what were some of your inbound plays that you used that were successful? And yeah, so I was just like a sponge, you know, just right. soaking it up. That to go along with what coach what I learned under Coach Wooten, that's a great combination. I mean, you can't go wrong. Un- unbeatable. You can't go wrong. Unbeatable. Even, even, unbeatable. And even to this day, you know, even at Bishop McNamara, anybody who plays for me, our press breaker is called Bob Head. Like, wow. and the kids. And I asked my kids at McNamara, I'm like, do you even know what that means? You know, they were like, <laughs> they're like, nah, you know, that's the name of the play, right? I was like, no, that's a person. Right. And they're like, really? I'm like, yes. I said, yes. I said, I need you to Google him. You know, so so they have a play. They'll call it all day. You know, they'll say, Bob Hen, Bob Hen. You know, they don't, and that's our press breaker. That's a, so in the WCAC, I mean, WCAC championship, you hear us calling Bob Hen, you know, and, <laughs> you know, at, at, at American University. So. Uh, so yeah, it's still, you know, that'll always be with me. Definitely. Absolutely. Um, and, 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 and speaking of no, you know, learning his philosophy, you actually had the chance, um, to see his philosophy up close and actually play against it. Well, coach against it. Um, so, <laughs> you know, you've coached in, you know, a lot of big games since, you know, since you've been at HD and since you've been at Bishop Mack, um, you know, number of championships, state title games. But in my opinion, the biggest or, you know, maybe better said, probably the most fun um, game that you coached in was the biggest game that nobody got on film. Um, so yeah. talk about so talk about that time um, that you and Coach Hedden went head to head, Team Hedden versus Team Mazda. But talk, talk about that. Yeah. Talk about that game right there, man. No, I, I think that was the greatest game. That nobody ever saw, you know, because it was on social media. And it, although it was it was a packed gym, there was no social media. There was no really no video of it. I don't. Um, and I think that you know that's something that we have. Uh, you know, we just have to go off memory. Right. We just, we just have to go off memory with it. So um, that game was supposed to be played. It was played. They were getting ready to demolish the old Woodson, mm-hmm. and it was two thousand eight. Um, the seniors of 2008, they graduated. That was after our first championship. And, um, you know, everybody was really shocked that we won the city title that year because 
it was so difficult. It was the first time that Woodson had won a city title or uh, since I think 1992, last time we had won one, according to Coach Russell, uh, who was the athletic director at the time, Lionel Russell, yeah. oh, the track coach. Yeah, Coach Russell. So he said, he said, man, it's been a long time. You know, <laughs> he said that at, at the Verizon Center. He said, he gave me a hug. He said, man, it's been a long time since 92. And so, yeah, so it had been since 1992 since H.D. Woodson had won a city title. And I was under Coach Hedden. And, you know, so we were riding high, you know, and we, I had every, mostly everybody back. I had two seniors. Uh, but they were still – they hadn't left yet for the summer to go to universities. Patrice Johnson was going to Wake Forest, and Tashe Mosey was going to uh, Maryland Eastern Shore. So, and everybody else was coming back. So we were loaded. And um, they said, that, hey, we're going to play this game, this alumni game between the current team and some uh, an alumni. And one of the alumni played for me and Coach Hedden, so she just went ahead and played for Coach Hedden and that. And that was Avery Worley, who's still in the WNBA right oh, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a, a 6'3 power forward. She played for me. Prior, we won our first DCIAA championship with her. So we had won back-to-back DCIAA championships at this point, but our first city title. Um, and so actually we had won mm-hmm. three in a row. We had won three DCIAA championships in, in a row. And this was our first city title. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was an amazing setup. And he literally – Coach Hedden really had all his uh, championship players come back. I mean, and they were in prime condition. Uh, oh. Cammy Brown, Cammy Brown, Sandria Green. Um, he had even Jamel Elliott, who's coaching at UConn right now, who played at UConn what? and who won, who won Geno RMS for Coach Hedden used to go to the Final Fours because he had players that played at Rutgers, UConn, you know, and, and Jamel Elliott is currently coaching right now at UConn. Yeah. And uh, and Coach Hayden used to tell me, like, yeah, I was just at the Final Four with Jamel because he would have tickets. You know, she went to Johnson and she came to – so he told me a story about how she came to Woodson. And so that was one of his players, and she was coaching with him. So I have to coach against Coach Hayden right. and Jamel oh, Elliott, who was, who was two Hall of Famers. And, yeah. You know, not just, not just Woodson Hall of Famers. These are D.C. Hall of Famers, both right. of them. Um, right. I mean, just legends. And – you know, then he had Avery Worley on the team. He had Sierra Banks, who had both played for me in, in 06, 07. Uh, actually, 06. They graduated 06. And then he had Cammy Brown, Tangier Green. Um, that, well, I mean, he had every – it was all of his former players. Um, who else? Carlito, Carlito Washington. Mm-hmm. Um, he had all – I mean, she was still Stacked playing professionally roster. overseas. Mm-hmm. Stacked roster. I mean, they were 6'5", 6'4". I mean, they were huge. Um, 6'2 guards. I mean – you know, just Final Four because Carlito Washington played in the Final Four for Rutgers. Goodness, they were they were loaded. I mean, and I had my current team, yeah. which I believed in wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. I believed in my team wholeheartedly, and we it was a battle. And I had Carlita Green, you know, was in her junior year. I had Ronika the Razor Ransford. I had Bernicia Pinkett. Yeah. I, had, I had Big JJ, who yeah. I just talked to last week. JJ was you know six six, you know. Uh, 300, you know, she was larger than life. Mm. So she held the middle down for us. Um, and we just, we just went to battle. We went to war, you know, and we actually, it was back and forth, but we actually took a good lead. I mean, we were up by, you know, 15 points, I believe. I mean, no I think kidding. it was, we had a 15, and it was tough scoring, but we had a 15 point lead. And, um, and then, you know, you know, it was Coach Fuller was officiating and and, oh, no. and, and we were and, and we were trying to hold the ball, you know. So I spread, I spread everybody out, and we were uh-huh. doing, you know, we were just iso because I was like, oh, we just playing against the clock. We are gonna run this clock out because right. I had to coach it, you know. I, I wasn't playing like an all star game. We were trying to win, and I knew that this, <laughs> I knew that this was gonna, you know, see how people viewed our legacy there, mm-hmm. and so you know, because Coach Head, that's that's an impenetrable legacy, but I think I was kind of making a dent, you know, just with the success that we had, we hadn't lost the game in, D- in DC period, you know, and we, and we didn't want to start even with this game and we were up and we were spreading the ball. And the next thing you know, they started getting five second calls on us, you know, oh, so man. you guys are holding the ball, but I don't think it was five seconds. We were getting past them, but it was like, we couldn't even do anything without a five second call. We call. So it was yeah. a lot of, a lot of calls, Look, you know, I'm like old, some old you know, school. Home yeah. Nah, yeah. I, I love Coach <laughs> Ford. I love Amanda, you know, but I think they, you know, they made sure that, you know, that, Coach Hayden had a couple opportunities and they yeah. called some fouls on us and things like that. So it ended up being – so even with all that being said, because we had that cushion, um, you know, the other team, they, you know, Coach Hayden came back, but we had the cushion and we we were able to hold on and we had the last shot. And it was tied up. I, I believe it was either 52-52 or 56-56. It was tied up. 
And it went and down to the, got, last, the last possession? And we had the last possession, which is the way I wanted it. Yeah, with that, which is the way I wanted it. And I felt like, you know, obviously, I felt like we, it should have been over early, but yeah. that's a different story. But, yeah, <laughs> so it came down to the last shot. We had it. Uh, and Carlita Green had the last shot. Um, and, and it just three, two, one. She let it go. It back rimmed. Oh, and it went out. And and I kind of looked over. And, you know, we were kind of ready for overtime. Mm-hmm. And then, But I knew, you know, just looking at the crowd, you know, they were – I know that that's their side was like happy just to get it to that overtime, but they were like, "All right, that's it. That's how we're gonna end this this big game." <laughs> yeah. And the game, it was no overtime. It just ended at a tie score, and it might have, yeah, it was. It might have either high forties, low fifties. It might even if it was forty eight or fifty two, but the game ended right there, and that was the last game played at the Tower of Power on that court before they demolished the school. What a it was game. the last gathering of alumni. Yeah, they had the band there, alumni band was playing. I mean, it was packed. They had some performances from alumni. If you go on YouTube, mm-hmm. you can probably see some of those, the band, like, they'll show, they show a band performance, mm-hmm. but the game was played during that time, but I don't know if anybody filmed the game, but okay. there was a band performance going on, and I, I thought I had a film of it, but I didn't. I don't think I had the film of it that day, but it was a legendary game. Just imagine if some, man, Oh, I, I I think I said this earlier, but just imagine if there was social media at that time. Oh, oh yeah, a lot God. of D one, yeah, a lot of D one, a lot of lot of Division one Hall of Famers in that in that game. You know, so, yeah, it was legendary, Man. and I was glad I got a chance to see you know how good his players were because I always heard the story. He told me the stories, and I kind of got to read about them. Mm-hmm. You would see the pictures on the wall at yeah. the school. He he had the shrine to all his former players, football and girls basketball, and. Just to see how talented and gifted they were, I'm like, wow! I knew, I see why they tore up the league. <laughs> so when you but, think you about, know. so when you think about that game, and mm-hmm. you know, when you look back at it, you know, all these years later, um, like, like, what, what do you feel, man? Because that's 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 a a big legendary event, not just you know in HD history, but in just DC history. Period. You know, it was the right. last game at it was the actual last. Athletic game at H- at the Tower Power, yeah. Um, and all these legends, you know. And then, of course, and then you know, throw what you and your teams of went on to be able to do. You know, looking back at it now, like what are you like? Just what do you feel and what are your thoughts? No, I mean, just I was very proud at how my girls played, and it just proved that we belonged and that we, um, just the fact that I, I believe that we, you know, we controlled the game, and just the fact that we did. It just, you know, just let me know that we were doing the right things and that we we had something very, very special, you know, very special because we would go on um, to win the city title again the next year. Mm-hmm. You know, we actually won back to back city titles and we um, were leading at halftime of the next of the next five, actually. So, um, yeah, no, it just showed that we belong. It showed that we were a part of the school's legacy. Um, it showed that, you know, we were right up there with some of those those greats and. I think when they built the new school, if you look at the new school, you'll see um, a, a section that's dedicated to Coach Head and his uh, young ladies. And then you also see a section that's dedicated to to the young ladies that played for me while, while I was there. So I think that was just a testament to the respect that was earned that day and just throughout the years, you know, because it takes a lot to earn that respect. But I just felt like we earned that respect, you know, playing with those legends. And I felt like our girls belong to be in that same breadth and category. Because to me, they are. Absolutely. Now, let's kind of shift gears a little bit, man. Um, now, again, like you said, you guys absolutely, absolutely had something special um, during that eight-year run. And it was it was great. It was absolutely amazing. Um, like when I was in when I was when I was in high school at that time um, at mm-hmm. HD, um, it was never, you know, we never questioned whether you whether or not you guys won. You know, it was never like, hey, did the girls win? <laughs> It was always how bad did they beat whoever they was playing? You know, was it ninety to five? Was it ninety seven to three or whatever the you know, whatever the out unbelievably outlandish score, you know, score split was. Um it but the run was great. Um but like you shared with me before, um, you know, other conversations that we've had, 
it you know it wasn't all cupcakes and giggles you know it wasn't right. just you, know, you guys get out there and play win and everything is you know peachy keen it wasn't it wasn't like that you know at right. all you know from the fathers from them um, mm-hmm. you and your players faced a lot of challenges you know not just not just you know as a team but personally you know within your own personal families you know mm-hmm. troubles with administration and other things like that. So kind of talk about, you know, some of the hardships that you all face during that, during that eight-year run. No, I mean, it's always challenges, you know, just going to school in the city. So that it just goes hand in hand, I think, with all of the challenges that are faced by uh, students and af- student athletes, students, teachers, coaches, administrators. It's just being in the city itself it presents its own unique set of challenges. Um, obviously, uh, you know, you're surrounded. Just the environment is rough. You know, surrounded by a lot of violence, um, you know, a lot of poverty. Um, and I think that that has an impact on everything that you do. So what I try to do is just try to level the playing field and, and talk about the future. You know, I said you can't help where you're coming from, but you can help where you're going. Wow. So we used to always focus on, you know, you, you nobody can, can. And my mother used to tell me that, you know, you can't control who your parents are. You can't control, you know, where you were born or what environment you started out your life in. But you can definitely control where you're going. And so that's what we were focus in on. And that was important for us every single day to come in the gym and work hard and be disciplined because we were, there were so many distractions around the girls that I just kept them in the gym. Like our practice schedule was crazy because I would make sure all year round that they had something to do. You know, so we were trying it. And, and in so the, important. Yeah. Yeah. We stay, I kept them busy. And they'll yeah. tell you, I mean, and I was hard on them because. I wanted them to see, get out. I wanted them to make it out. Right. That was my whole goal. I wanted them to see other things. I wanted them to get to to travel outside of the city, see what it was like, and say, you know what, there's something else out here, and I'm gonna go get it. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stay here. Uh, I'm gonna use basketball as a means, as a passport to my education, and I'm gonna take it as far as I can go, and I'm gonna empower myself and my family to a better to a better situation. I think that's that was my goal. It was. The championships and the winning, that was just a byproduct of all of the hard work and the grind that we were putting in for them to get to college. I just wanted them to get mm-hmm. to college because I felt as if they were exposed to college, then they would have a completely different outlook on life um, and it would propel them. They would be in a better situation than they were growing up. And that was the goal. So winning was just a byproduct of all of that. But that wasn't my focus. My focus was never winning. I mean, winning happened because we we put the work in. But the whole goal of the program was for them to get to college and graduate from college, not just go. Right. But go and finish. That was my goal. My goal is when a lot of people, a lot of student athletes got a chance to go to college, but a lot of them didn't finish. Right. So I wanted to change and that's that a narrative. Big difference. Going is yeah. one, but finishing, yeah. that's a whole nother story. Finishing is a whole nother story. So yeah. I wanted them to obtain a scholarship and then retain this scholarship because I went to college and I saw a lot of guys got sent home. You know, even the ones that were on scholarship, if they didn't, you know, handle business in class, if they didn't understand how to communicate with the coach, if they didn't understand just the college lifestyle, they would get sent home. And nobody talked about that. And I did not want that to happen uh, to our kids. So I said, if we can kind of prepare them for those situations, then they would be okay. But, yes, we had challenges with uh, violence. We lost a lot of family members uh, to to gun violence, um, you know, during that time which was very difficult. Um, you know, we lost some parents to, you know, medical conditions. Um, there were some times where, you know, close family members were, were murdered, um, you know, and they had ongoing investigations. So it was very difficult during those times. But basketball is what kind of – basketball kept us together. So that was the glue that kept us uh, on the right path. It was our therapy, being in the gym, working hard, working together, playing the game that we love. And, and for me, coaching the game that I love was like therapy to get through all those things. Um, we did face some challenges. You know, one year, uh, Janice Johnson going into our second uh, or our second city title run um, on the way to the championship. You know, Janice Johnson, uh, D.C. Public Schools ruled her ineligible because they said that she was violated the eighth semester rule, and which which wasn't true. Yeah, which wasn't true. And I was told repeatedly and I appealed it. And I told them that, no, she's, you know, she was only 17 years old. She had literally just turned 17. And I was like, no, she just turned 17. Like, she's not, you know, I was like, she, people out here playing, they're 18, 19. You know, I was like, she's 17. I said, this is her situation. This is what happened. And they just, the appeal was denied. 
Um, so she missed the first 16 games of the season. And he was said, oh, yeah, she's done. She's not going to be able to play. And I was like, I just didn't give up because I saw that she, her mother passed away that that fall. Um, oh, really? I, yeah, and I promised her mom that I was going to make sure that she not only received scholarship, but she graduated from college. Right. And so this was impacting her ability to go to college. So I said, you know what? So I ended up going to Bread for the City, which was an intake. I uh, actually got referred to by my assistant coach, Coach Anglin, uh, Henry Anglin. And he said, you know, there's a Bread for the City intake right there near Good Hope Road. And I, at that time, I was uh, living over there. And I just, I went in and I told them the case. They actually took the case pro bono. And a retired federal judge took the case. Yeah, he took the case. And literally from that Saturday when I went to break for the city to the next Saturday, they had t- taken the case pro bono. It was a major law firm who represented Coca-Cola, Xerox, those type of corporations. Mm-hmm. They took the case and uh, it was called Morrison and Forrester. That was the law firm. And they, by the next Saturday, they had spoken to D.C. Council. They had spoken to Michelle Ree who was the chancellor at that time and, and who had wrote me a letter personally saying that JJ was going to be ineligible. And I just did not stop it. That. Yeah. I want to stop. I did not accept it because I believed, I, I believed that they were wrong. And we, uh, when Morrison and Forrester took the case, she was deemed eligible by that next Saturday. You know, that when they looked at reviewed all the facts, they had built up a case uh, that showed that she was, um, not in violation of that rule and that it was the D.C. public schools was liable for that. Um, and, you know, she won the case and the settlement was that she was able to play. And she was able to play in her first game back was against McKinley Tech. And with her in the lineup, um, not only did her spirit come back, because obviously all this happened while she lost her mom. So that therapy that we talked about was taken away from her. Right. So um, because, instantly. Because what a lot of people yeah. probably don't remember when you're ineligible. Like you can't practice or anything. She couldn't. Yeah. No, nope. she couldn't do anything. You know, and, and that was that was very very difficult uh, for her. And I was just thinking about her. Obviously, you know, we played without her. We had to continue to play the season. But um, you know, the Personal. the other young ladies, yeah, the other we we kept, we kept her close. Uh, and and people don't know it was a family. We're, we were a family, so we did everything together. So you know, to try to exclude some someone somebody from our family, it was it was very difficult. And um, when the, when this is what is, is keeping them afloat, you know, the travel, um, checking in on their work, which we continue to do, um, you know, just the family dinners we had, basically the breakfasts, you know, the lunches, you yeah. know, we did, you know, we traveled and ate and, and, and we were a family, we were all a family, you know, and, and so they kind of took that away from her. And, um, you know, when you do that, you know, someone, so one can become depressed, you know, or, or, you know, lose hope you know, or, or sink into despair. So, you know, we did everything we could. To, and I kept telling her, I was like, we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going to beat this. You're going, you're going to play, you're going to be fine. And she was eligible by that uh, end of January, I believe going into February. And uh, after missing those 16 games and she finished the season with us and the city title game, I mean, she had the most amazing first half in front of Mary and Barry, Mary, uh, F- uh, Mayor Fenty, mm-hmm. Uh, Muriel Bowser was there because she was a council woman at that time. Um, that in 2000 and 2008 or 2009. 2009. Yeah. Yeah. That was 2009 city title. And uh, when I say that that was the most amazing, we played good council. And that was probably one of yeah. the most amazing games I've ever seen. Because in the first half, I think she scored almost 20 points in the first half. I mean, we kept calling her play until she was tired. She was like, Coach, I'm tired. I said, we're going to keep <laughs> running the play. And in the second half, she gets in foul trouble. So she really um, – couldn't give us much. She was in yeah. foul trouble, so she didn't play that much. And, and Ronika Ransford, who was a junior, um, ended up scoring 20 in the second half, mm-hmm. you know, alone, you know, to, to pick up the slack. She said, I got your back. I got you. Uh, Bernisha Pinkett was steady the whole time. Carlita Green steady the whole time. And so they kind of, you know, carried the load. Those four carried the load. And J.J. fouled out. But when she fouled out, they gave her a standing ovation. Yep, yep, yep. I remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's emotional thinking about that. I mean, because that yeah. was – Full circle, and then um, you know, a lot of positive things happened after that. You know, and I know you'll probably ask about some things that happened after that later, but we did get a special invitation after that. Yeah, man. And speaking of a special invitation, man, you set up that you, you you lead me right into to my next to the to the next thing I want to talk about with you. So, like I said, despite despite all the challenges, you guys kept on you all kept on dominating. 
won another city title game. Um, and from that point, especially with um, the attention that JJ's you know story got, um, you all, and, and, and in addition to the dominant play that you all um, were doing on the court, you all started to get a lot of local, big time local and national attention. Um, even right. so much so that even President Obama and at that time Vice President Biden, who is now um, the president now, President Biden, knew about the team and and you guys got an invite and you know they recognized you guys during that time. So kind of just talk about that invite to the White House um, because I think when when you told me this a while back, it was. One of the most legendary things that yeah. I had heard about the team. So just go ahead and talk about that uh, that White House visit. No, yeah. Well, before that season, you know, we talked. I talked to the team about we, after we won our first city title, and we had an outstanding summer traveling as a as a club team called the DC Cobras mm-hmm. uh, that I created, and um, we we oh, just you created the DC Cobras. Yes, yes. Oh, I know that and DC Cobras uh, was a yeah. was a nonprofit I created in two thousand six, mm-hmm. and um, it was. It was an acronym Cobra standard for a uh, Cobra stood for uh, college opportunity through basketball readiness and academic success. And um, that's what that was the acronym. And that was the program. And it was actually a SYEP program. So it was that's, our young oh, ladies. That's, yep, that's true. Yeah, it was. yeah. And our young ladies got paid to um, to to study their academics in the morning and work out, travel and get college exposure, you know, in the, in the weekends. And that's what we did, you know, and it, and it worked 100 percent. And uh, it's ironic that Miss Freeman was one of the ones that down at SYP that helped me out. And I ended up working with her daughter at Bishop McNamara. Her daughter went to Bishop McNamara. And, Some of the, uh, uh, Danny, well, Danny Freeman? Yes, yes. Okay. She, her daughter. Wow. Yeah, so her daughter, Jata, Jata Freeman went to Bishop mm-hmm. McNamara, was there all four years with me. And uh, she actually played basketball a little bit. And I had a conversation with her. I said, I think you should play lacrosse. Because I think, you know, and, and lo and behold, she gets a lacrosse scholarship to Howard University. No kidding. And she's doing well. And she's – so I love Miss Freeman. You know, I like to yeah. say hi to Miss Freeman and, and Jata. Um, But, yeah, so Miss Freeman helped me out uh, to make sure the girls had all their paperwork done and that we were always – we always checked in with her. And, and I never met her until I got to McNamara, ironically. But I yeah. never met her personally, but I always spoke with her on the phone. So, yeah. Um, she good people. So, yeah. she, um, she helped me out a couple of times. Not interviewed no, she, for at uh, one of the one of the career fairs they had. So yeah, she's yeah. so cool. No, she's she's awesome, awesome, yeah. and she I, I couldn't have done I couldn't have done that part without her because I was just moving and shaking, and I had all the team with me, and we were I was making sure that they had their schedule down. So uh, she really really helped out. She was a godsend, and God sends people in your life uh, to help you because none of this was done through me. I, I think God has guided me the whole way. So I've had a lot of great people, Henry Anglin. Uh, couldn't have done any of that without him. Um, he was there every step of the way. Um, just dedicated individuals that were around me to help. Me. But yeah, so I told the, the the kids, I said, you know what, if we win the city title again, I think we're going to get invited to the White House. Mm-hmm. And I said that, and I didn't know for sure, but I kind of, I just felt it in my heart because yeah. we had been contacted by the State Department previously to host people from out of the country and a couple of years prior. And I was like, well, now they have something to really celebrate. You know, I said, yeah. we're really, a, you know, a team. And the Washington Post did a story on us about JJ and her situation. Mm-hmm. They actually did an expose on her the entire year. So from the, oh, they from did? the from, oh, yeah, from the I time she was I, ineligible. I the story. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. All the way until she was uh, eligible, until wow. she, you know, they followed all the way through to this invitation. And I get a call after the season, we get a call from the State Department. Uh, Inviting us to the White House. Wow! Just, um, so it's almost like we spoke, we've spoken into existence, you know, and yeah. and I believe in the power of that. And then, yeah, we got invited to host the Easter Egg Roll, the basketball station, at President Obama's first ever Easter Egg Roll in, in the spring of two thousand, April of two thousand nine, and that was just amazing. Um, so we go there, and they converted the tennis courts into basketball courts, and we're working. And they said, "Hey, you know, you have a shift," and I said, "We'll take the whole shift." We'll right. take the whole. They were like, "Okay, you guys are working the whole day," and we were there from the morning until the afternoon until it shut down. And uh, a lot of celebrities were there. A lot of, um, you know, there's some NBA players, some WNBA players, mm-hmm. uh, act- actors, actresses. Um, and then, lo and behold, the first uh, Secret Service come in there, and next thing you know, 
they come in and do a sweep, and I'm like, okay, a lot of guys with earpieces mm-hmm. and weapons. And next thing you know, President uh, assistant, I said assistant, uh, Vice President Biden comes in. Um, and he talks to the team. He meets with the team, shakes everybody's hand, took took selfies with us. You know, that's and that's incredible. What, yeah. So I have that picture. You know, I took a picture with him, and also JJ took a picture with him. And next thing you know, so he leaves out. He's very nice. I mean, he's very just you know one of the nicest guys you ever meet. I mean, he was, and this is when he was the vice president, and um, you know, he didn't, you know, and he knew who we were, you know, that which was amazing. Wow. So. He just, you know, said congratulations. You know, you're doing a great job. Keep up the he good work. Guys? Yeah, he recognized. That's me. tight. That's because I think I think they were briefed on on that. And I know President Obama is a avid basketball fan. So, mm-hmm. um, so next about thirty minutes later, Secret Service came in again, and I said, I said, ladies, I think it's the president coming in. You know, and this was he, his presidency was so huge for us. You know, and and you know how the feeling was at that time, and so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was just a surreal feeling. Um, and, and he comes in and he's, it's him. You know, it's its President Obama. He has that swag about him and he's yep. just the leader of the free world. And uh, he just, you know, he came up to JJ first and he was, he said, didn't I read about you in the Washington Post? Oh my <laughs> goodness. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. And JJ just, I, know she, and JJ, I know she was floored. She didn't say, she couldn't say a word. <sighs> She was just like, <laughs> like, 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 literally, her mouth dropped, and she was just like, she was shaking his hand, like, and you know, she's taller than him, you know, she's right, six, right. so she's kind of looking <laughs> down on him, but she's like, you know, she's kind of just shaking her head, and then uh, he was like, you know, keep up the good work, you know, I'm, I'm following you guys, and so he comes over, shakes my hand, said, good, you know, congratulations, coach. He shakes every girl's hand on the team. Wow, all of them. Um, I think we had 11 girls, 12 girls that year, mm-hmm. shook all their hands. Um, and we, you know, there were some kids coming in. So we were, kids were shooting around. He kind of shot around, you know, what he did. you know, how he comes and shoots, he's left-handed uh-huh. he comes and, he, and he takes a couple of uh-huh. shots, but he was, um, very personable and, you know, you know, it was, it was a lot of photo ops and it's in the national archive now. So you can kind of see us. If you Google president Obama's first Easter egg roll, you'll see us right there with him. You know, those are the pictures. We didn't really have the type of cameras that they have now. The cell phones didn't have cameras like that. Uh, we did get a couple of pictures, but, um, and I got some video, but it wasn't good. Yeah. But if you go in the National Archive, there's some pictures that I was able to pull up, and you see us standing right there with them. You see Carlita, Ronika, Bernicia, Chanel Green was a freshman, mm-hmm. um, Jeffany Brown, Ronnie Bell, JJ. You see all of us right there with President Obama. But it was a very special day. And then we took a picture at the White House. We took a picture outside of the White, on the mm-hmm. White House lawn. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty cool. I still have that picture. But you know, I just wish the technology was better because if it was Snapchat and Instagram back oh then. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you talk about that yeah. thing, it'd have went, it, it would have went up. Yes, it would have. Definitely. definitely. Yeah. So after, so after that, what <laughs> – man, mm. I, I'm just thinking, like, if I had an experience like that, what, what, yeah. I would have been like J.J., she was, yeah. she probably she probably played it a whole lot cooler than I would have. I would have been like, "Oh my God, Mr. President, it's so cool to." I, I, blah, 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 blah. But um, yeah. so after after you guys left that day, like what 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 were their thoughts about it, man? What were they saying? I know they had to be on cloud nine. No, yeah, I mean, I, I think just their their whole experience, and I was hoping that when they got older, mm-hmm. they would appreciate. It. I I knew that it was a lot for them to take in, and being seventeen, sixteen, yeah. or even, yeah. just being with me from the time they were thirteen to eighteen. <laughs> You know, because a lot of them were, you know, like Bernice Pinkett, Carlita Green. Carlita Green was with me from the time she was 12, you know, until she was, until she graduated. And, and even to this day, we still, you know, in contact, you know, so all of them, you know, still in contact with each other. I just talked to JJ the other day um, mm-hmm. for, for about an hour. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, I was just hoping that when they became adults, mm-hmm. that they would appreciate that. And I knew that it wouldn't kick in until later, until they got to college. But, um, you know, I was just... It was a lot. It was a lot for them to digest because I kept them busy. So right. um, I don't know if they really fully understood everything that was going on at that time. But I definitely, after having spoken to them now, as you know, with them being adults now, yeah, they definitely they really and, and it's it's had an impact on their life now. I'm sure. I'm sure. That's what it's all about. Right. And and, and that's the sign of that's the sign of success. And you mentioned yeah, earlier, yeah. Um, that's the one of the main things that you wanted to do was just to give them those different experiences. So yep. especially, you know, 
getting them to college, you wanted them to be able to experience things like that. So to open their yeah. horizon. So Correct. in addition to like that, that, that unbelievable white house invite, um, what are some of the other experiences um, that you and your team were able to have during that time? Um, you know, I, I just going to Phoenix, Arizona, um, going to playing against playing in the, in the Nike tournament of champions, you know, at, at that time we were a Nike sponsored team, which I think was, you know, probably not normal in the city. I think we were probably one of the, the, the first ones um, that were, I had a sponsored team where they would, you know, we didn't, you know, shoes and backpacks and things like that and, and uniforms and, um, you know, I think playing on the Nike circuit, you know, playing against other Nike schools and actually the head of Nike uh, grassroots, Tony Dorado, actually came to H.D. Woodson. Um, really? And bought, yeah, and bought Brian Davidson, who was at that time one of his, uh, you know, associates, uh, assistants. Mm-hmm. Um, and they both came to the new H.D. Woodson when it opened up um, and spoke to the girls. So that was Chanel Green. That was my last year at Woodson. And they actually came and visited the school set for a game. I think we played Westlake out of Waldorf. Mm-hmm. And they and they sat for the game. They sat courtside uh, for the game. So this is the head of Nike Grassroots, who's coming from headquarters, and and he's a he's he's over all of Nike uh, Grassroots in the United States of America. He came and sat at HD Woodson on our behalf. Came and spoke to the team. Wow. I have that on, I have that on video. Actually, came and talked to the girls, and oh man, he, tweeted, awesome. he retweeted uh, when the new Woodson was being built, and I posted some pictures. He retweeted those pictures for Nike. Um, and actually, Brian Davidson is now the uh, the rep for Giannis, uh, the MVP. So he works oh, specifically. Really? He, yeah, okay. yeah, he started out of high school, wow. and now he's with. So I look, and I still, I'm still in contact with him. But yeah, you know, even though I'm, I'm with Under Armour now, but at that time, you know, I was with Nike. So That's you know, cool. it was that, that was that was another amazing experience because you know it, it's you know money's tight in the city, yeah, and so. Anything and then, and that, that we especially could, at that time, girls, yeah. athletics, more, yeah, so. yeah. So that really every little bit helped, and that and that helped make their experience better because it wasn't like they they had money to go get a whole bunch of pair of shoes. You know, we were playing all the time, so any anything helped. If it was a couple pair of shoes or whatever, bags, shirts, you know, all that stuff that athletes wear. That that was that was a big deal for us. Yeah. For any coach, any coach would, would welcome that. Yeah. And I, and now I see it now. Like I see Wilson has it. You know, I see other schools have it now. But um, you know, it was def- definitely good to have it back in two thousand seven. Right. You know? And one and the main thing I asked about, especially you know those two events, because like I, like I said, I was a student at HD during that time, um, and I didn't even know about. I knew about the White House visit. I didn't know. That they recognized that they knew who you guys that they knew who you all were. That I didn't know. That's yeah. that's still yeah. legendary. But yeah. the Nike thing, I didn't know about you guys being sponsored by Nike, and I don't think that's talked about enough. So when um, I was developing the podcast, you know, and based on other conversations that we've had and stuff like that, I wanted to bring you on just so you can talk about some of the things that you all were able to do and accomplish and be a part of. Because that's a legendary program, you know, mm-hmm. that, that eight-year run. And then, of course, you know, mm-hmm. add, you know, in addition to what Bob Hedden did, H.D. Woodson's Girls Basketball is a legendary program. So, um, mm-hmm. man, I appreciate you so much, uh, man, just joining me, you know, and talking about just taking a stroll down memory lane, if you will, just talking about some of the things oh. that you all able to do, man. No, definitely, definitely. I appreciate being on here and. Like I said, it's all a part of the journey. You know, we, you know, just just a vessel being used to to help other people, and uh, God has blessed me and put me in this position, and I'm 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 forever grateful and thankful, and I will continue to do that as long as I can. Amen, my friend. So before I let you go, man, one I got I got one more thing I'm gonna ask you. So, what do you want people to remember about your teams when when you look back at just the whole scope of everything from those from that time what do you want people to remember um i want i would like for people to remember um you know that the young ladies that i work with were very very dedicated uh hard working they were disciplined uh you know they stayed focused they played extremely hard um and, and they were 
um, relentless. You know, they were relentless on the court, um, and they didn't let anything get in, in the way of their of their path. You know, they didn't let anybody distract them from what their goal was, which was to go to college. Uh, and I want people to remember that they all went to college. You know, and they went to college and they graduated, um, and that they, you know, they really represented H.D. Woodson in the proper light everywhere they went. And that's what I want people to remember. And and kind of to piggyback on that, I know I said that was the last thing, but kind of to piggyback on that, um, you're still in contact with all of them um, mm-hmm. to this day, which I think is just so great. Um, and and all of them, all of them are doing are, are great women are doing so many great things in their lives. Kind of speak on on, on some of the um, things that they're doing today. No, yeah, I mean, just that's something that that's that bond that you build. You know, when you go through. Um, you know, the years and years of, of development and uh, just building, you know, up a person, um, you, those relationships last for life, you know, and I think I always said that that would be the sign of whether or not I had a good program is what would they be doing 10 years from now? That's the sign, you know, if they're doing well 10 years from now, now that's to me, that's the championship, yep. you know, not the actual championship, but what are they doing 10, 15 years from now? That's the ultimate championship. So yeah. So Tia Bell actually, Works with me at Bishop McNamara. She's a freshman guidance counselor. She also has her own nonprofit organization. She's running the Trigger Project, which is in D.C. Um, she's doing huge things. She's she's such a I'm so proud of her um, and all that she's accomplished. She's a mother. Um, you know, she's uh, you know, she's engaged. I mean, so she's just a great young lady um, overall. And, and she's. I've been so proud of her since the time I met her as an eighth grader. Uh, mm-hmm. She's been so impressive. And she was the one who actually inspired me to coach, you know, going to high school coaching. Uh, so I'm forever grateful for her from that and uh, for that. And, uh, you know, Avery Worley, who's who's playing overseas right now. She's been a, she's been a professional basketball player for the last seven years. Yep. After she graduated from Liberty University and it's broken all the records at her university. And she's also married and is a mother um, doing very well. Um, you know, Bernicia Pinkett is actually over overseas. I think she's in Greece right now with her family. No yeah, kidding. she's in Greece. She's lived in Spain, Greece. I mean, I said, you know, her passport has been punched more than mine. You know, when I first <laughs> met them, you know, I was I was the one that had traveled overseas, but now Bernicia can tell me a thing or two about living in Europe because right, she's lived right. over there so much. Uh, she's also graduated at Kentucky uh, University of Kentucky. Um, you know, Carlita Green. Uh, you know, I'm still in contact with her. You know, she might do some coaching with me in the future. Um, you know, she's graduated VCU. Uh, Patrice Johnson's getting ready to get married. Um, she graduated Wake Forest. She's also doing well. Uh, she worked at a law firm. Um, but she's, I mean, just a, she's an amazing young lady um, as well. And just being at Courtney Kayard is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, you know, with her family, she's married with, with two children. Uh, and her husband is the uh, director of basketball operations at LSU. So mm. or men's basketball. So, yeah. So she's, you know, she, she's down there. And, um, yeah, just. What just, about JJ? Oh, JJ, JJ? oh, JJ. I talked to JJ. JJ's down in Tennessee. Uh, mm-hmm. JJ is uh, down. She works in the Rutherford County, I believe, Rutherford County Sheriff's Department. Really? Actually, so yeah, she works. She works oh, down there. Funny, man. Yeah. Yeah. So I talked to her. She's doing well. And actually, you know, we're in the process. She's in the process of writing a book about her story. So. You know, I'm going to help her with that, and uh, yeah. hopefully we can get something done on that eight-year run at H.G. Woods because I think it needs that story needs to be told in, a, in the book form, and I think J.J.'s story definitely should be told. Absolutely. She has she, she can inspire some people um, as well. Um, you know, Jeffany Brown and Chanel Green graduated from Hampton mm-hmm. University. Uh, Chanel's actually a college coach now. And so, you know, still in contact with all of them. You know, Janae Blunt, uh, Ronnie Bell. You know, Tasha Mosey, um, you know, all all of them have been very, very uh, close, you know, and they, they keep in contact. And definitely through social media, we can keep in contact even more. So that's why I love social media. I use that to keep in contact with all of them, for sure. That's awesome, man. Well, Ronnie I, Garansford I know, I know as well. I've this before. Yeah. Um, but, uh, man, you're doing the Lord's work, man, so much so. Um, I, I I haven't personally heard of um of a program to not only have the success on the court that you guys had but then most 90 95 if not 100 percent of the players to come out of the program 
doing so mm-hmm. many great things, man. Oh, yeah. So, um, it, it, it almost makes me emotional, you know, just looking back at it because yeah. I understand, you know, like you said, coming from, you know, yeah. the, the area. Um, yeah, it's tough. And it, it's, it's incredible. It's just, it's just incredible, man. Um, and I just salute you, man. I'm, I just appreciate you. Um, I just thank you for um, allowing Tia as an eighth grader to inspire you, man, and just uh, and just let mm-hmm. God guide you um, through everything that you've done um, and everything that you're now doing up at Bishop McNamara. Um, I can't wait to read your book. I, I know <laughs> I, I say this all the time, and every time I talk to you, I'm going to say it. I can't wait to read your book as well, man. I'm definitely working on it. I'm definitely working on it now. Definitely working on it. And I appreciate I appreciate you. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm proud of you as well. I appreciate that, man. Now, Very proud of you. Now, like I said, man, I ain't gonna hold you. One more thing. How about Byron <laughs> Leftwich coaching in the Super Bowl? Yes. Now, now I want you because this ties in. I yeah. I know people are going to love this because when you told me, you know, about you know, 45 minutes or so ago, it it kind of it floored me. So talk about how Byron coaching in Tampa and coaching in the Super Bowl ties in with your childhood <laughs> and your girls basketball team at HD. Tie, tie all oh, that yeah. Oh, it's all tied in. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy when you think about it, but it just shows you how the Lord works. Yeah, um, yeah Byron Leffridge is H.D. Woodson legend. Mm-hmm. Um, his, his junior high coach at Evans Junior High used to referee my games mm-hmm. uh, when I was in middle school uh, at St. John's Chillum which is amazing, with Coach Tyler. And so, yeah, Byron went to – it. actually played with one of his teammates, Attila Cosby, who came to DeMatha with me for briefly for a year, really? uh, who also went to Evans. I don't know if you remember mm-hmm. Attila, but, yeah, so Byron Leftwich, man. Yeah, he came by 2011, 2012. So spring of two, well, the 2012 season, which is my last year at Woodson, he came by. He was the uh, He was the backup quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers at the time. He was rehabbing his shoulder injury. He was getting ready for what would be his final year in the NFL as a, as a player. And he came in the gym and said, Coach, I want to work out with you guys. And I'm just like, hey, you know, why not? There was a month gap in between wow. the, the DCIAA championship. And for whatever reason, the city title, they couldn't work out the contract with the with the arena. So something happened. And so in order to get the Verizon, they had to wait three or four weeks, you know, so we had to, so we had idle time. And then we were going to play in the Geico Nationals, which is going to be on ESPN in right April. Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know what? It works. We're going to train every day. We're going to scrimmage. We're going to work out. And then we're going to get ready for the city title. And then we're going to go play on ESPN, which is our last, uh, our last games coaching at Woodson. Mm-hmm. And so Byron Leftwich came and practiced with us every day. He just came out of the blue. End. And ironically, people don't know that, that, that particular spring, not only was he there, but Tavon Wilson has was a senior at at uh, Illinois, and he was getting ready to get drafted by the Patriots. So he was in the gym. He and I oh, knew him. Serious, yeah. And I knew Tavon wow. personally as well because you know we had a we had our own relationship. So Tavon and I had our own relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Josh Morgan, yeah. who was getting ready to be the rest the receiver for the Redskins, who went to Virginia Tech, another HD Woodson graduate who played for. For, for Coach Fuller, he was in the gym. So all of this was going on at the same time. So we That's had Byron Leftwich, <laughs> Tavon Wilson walking, you know, walking through the gym, you know, going to talk to the football team and Coach Fuller and the guys getting ready to get drafted by the Patriots. And then you had Josh Morgan, who had just came home from playing with the 49ers. Right. He was about to be playing for the Redskins and I guess RG3, uh, I believe, a few years later. Mm-hmm. So he was there. So Byron Leftwich is practicing with us every day consistently. You know, he's he was a man of his word. Like he literally yeah. practiced with us every day. And he was the scout team. He said, Coach, I'm gonna be the scout team center uh for, for the team that you're gonna play. That's tough. And so that's and so that's what he did. And so he was scout team, he ran the sprints, he script played in the scrimmages. The Washington Post tried to sneak in and take pictures. I think they might have this is the early days of tweeting. So yeah, there was one early tweet of him practicing with us and saying they got it. And I told him, and he said, you know what? He said, I'm getting ready to retire, coach. I'm going to play one more year. Wow. I'm going to retire. And he said, uh, he said, I think I'm going to go into coaching. So lo and behold, wow. Tampa Bay was one of the teams he had played for within his career. And mm-hmm. I told him, you know, I was from Tampa originally. I said, my father played for the Buccaneers. You know, that's where I, you know, I was born right next to the stadium. You know, I was, I, I, you know, I love the Bucs. And so, so I've always been a Bucs fan. So fast forward to now, you know, he's the, 
Bruce Arias was his offensive coordinator that last year he was playing in Pittsburgh. And that's Byron true. Was, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, by, and Bruce, and Bruce Arias, Byron Leftwich and Bruce Arias won a Super Bowl in Pittsburgh already. Byron was a backup quarterback, and Bruce Arias was the offensive coordinator of that team. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, that's how they they ended up going to Arizona Cardinals, and then Bruce Arias retired. And I think I forgot where Byron went after that. And Byron stayed. Yeah. and was the quarterbacks coach, and then Bruce Arians got the head coaching job in Tampa. First person he called was Byron. Because he knows Byron is going to be a head coach one day in the league. Oh yeah, and so oh, no doubt. Yeah, so he's a, he's a brilliant mind, and so yeah, so he got the job, and and then he's Tom Brady. And what people don't realize is that Tavon Wilson won a Super Bowl ring with Tom Brady as a, a second year for rookie in New England. So yeah, Tom, oh my yeah, Tom, Tom Brady has a connection that with is Wilson all well. all connected, yeah. man. Yeah, and then so Byron left with so. And I go back to my parents. Both of my parents went to Kentucky State University, mm-hmm. which is in Frankfort, Kentucky, and they graduated in 74 and 75. And when my father's quarterback at Kentucky State was a guy named Michael Jackson, no relation to the superstar. <laughs> but his name was Michael Jackson. And guess where he was from? Washington, D.C. Went to Cardoza. Guess who his high school coach was? Who? Bob Hidden. Are you serious? Yeah. So it's a small world. So – my mother and father went to school with Michael Jackson in college, and he was uh, – Bob Hedden was – he was he, – guess what? He was a quarterback. He was a black quarterback. Wow. So Coach, Hed- Coach Hedden is legendary. Coach Hedden is legendary. That is the legend, Coach Bob Hedden. So Coach Bob Hedden has his imprint all on this Super Bowl. It just touched, touched a lot of people's lives. So Dang. it's a small world, man. People I'm don't know that. You. And in D.C., yeah. small yeah. world. D.C. is the smallest world. Yeah, so Coach Head, think about that. That was in 1969, I believe, 70, because my father played 70 to 75. So Michael Jackson was his quarterback at Kentucky State at that time, coming from Cardoza and Bob Head. Um, And so, yeah, yeah. So I think my father, he got drafted in 75. But, yeah, so it was just a small world. like, And I I was just talking with my parents about that the other day, and I don't even know if they even realized it. That Coach Head and they coached him, and also Coach Byron Leftwich. Wow, so this is a connection, DC connection, That's right there. Incredible. So you know, you, you got to root for Tampa because I'm you telling got, you, if you, I don't, you got I don't, Byron, I don't, I don't know, know what you, if you from Wilson. Wilson. you ain't rooting for Tampa. I don't know what yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and Byron Leftwich is a is a great guy. He's a great young man. Great, great guy. He's a good person. Um, he gave the girls advice. You know, he made sure that they were good. He told them about. Kyle, he talked to him about college. He talked to him about life. He told them to get out of the city. Yeah. He said, get out. He said, make it. He said, go. You know, he told them to get out and, and, and go see the world. That's what he told them. And that's what they did. No he gave them great advice. No doubt about that, man. He always checked up on them, too. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And he, he checked up even with the girls who were there mm-hmm. prior to me coaching at Woodson. He took he always made sure that he looked out for them and that he gave advice and, you know. Was always there for them if they needed them. Wow, man! Yeah. You can't beat that, man. And and nah. on that note, man, I'm I ain't gonna hold you. I, I don't think I don't think Wolf. I don't think it'll get better than that. That's a I think that's a <laughs> place to land a plane, man. Yeah. Uh, again, again, man. Thank you so much uh, for joining me. It's been great, man. Walking down memory lane with you and yeah. uh, and that Anytime. Little extra history lesson and and. And kind of tie in with Byron in the Super Bowl. I I didn't even know it was that deep. Like I knew that yeah. you and your family were from Tampa. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. Byron, and, you know, practice. With they the won. Man. I didn't know it went as even deeper than that. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And also Doug Williams. Doug Williams was the uh, was was one. Of, was the first black quarterback drafted in the first round by Tampa Bay. That's and, uh, true. And and guess who was the one who drafted him? was the offensive coordinator to convince the owner and the head coach at that time, John McKay, to draft him. And, and that guy was a young offensive coordinator named Joe Gibbs. So like, people don't know. And Doug Williams actually came ended to – Ended up playing – un- oh. Yeah, that's how, he came, that's how he ended up with the Redskins. And now Doug Williams just got promoted uh, to special assistant to the yeah. GM right now. And actually, Doug Williams, um, I got a chance to meet him a few – Last year, he came to one of our games last year. He walked in the gym, and I was just like, Doug, this is Doug Williams. He walked into the gym of Bishop Magnum <laughs> and sat down for a game. You know, so, yeah, it's a small, you know, because his daughter plays basketball, and she ended up mm-hmm. um, going to Paul Six, 
which is right. We were playing Paul the Six, and he just came to the game to see Paul the Six play, but he, they were playing us. So, you know, I introduced myself. He knew my parents, you know, he knew Tampa, you know, he knew the whole, he knew my godparents. He knew a lot of, you know, the people I knew in Tampa, and yeah. uh, he enjoyed the game. He really enjoyed the game. So I was happy that I got a chance to meet him. You can't. But he's that. Super Bowl back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, God I, is good. I love how DC is all up and through this Super Bowl. I oh, Todd Bowles. Todd Bowles. Todd Bowles. Todd Bowles. What the about defense, him? School me. Todd, school so me. the offensive coordinator is Byron Leftwich from HD Woodson. Mm-hmm. The defensive coordinator is the starting safety for the Washington Redskins from that Super Bowl of 87 with Doug Williams. That was the starting safety, Todd Bowles, number 27. So really? go back and look that up. Ty Bowles is a Redskins. Oh my champion. gosh! Are you serious? He, as, as a player, as a player, he played for the Redskins. He played wow. for Joe Gibbs. He won the Super Bowl with Doug Williams. That was, he was on the he was a starting safety. Todd Bowles. So there's a DC connection with Todd Bowles and Byron Leftwich. So That's you got to go for the Bucks. Yeah, got to. God, Todd Bowles man. is a Redskin. Todd Bowles is a Redskin for life. Excuse me. And I let me take that back because that's what they were called at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, now it's Washington football team. Yeah, so I apologize. Let me be politically correct. The Washington football team. But Todd Bowles played for the Washington football team, and he won the Super Bowl against John Elway and the Denver Broncos. I think it's eight, it was 87, 88. Mm-hmm. 87. Yeah, that, 87. That's, that's Super Bowl. So if you go back, you can watch that Super Bowl on YouTube, and you can see Todd Bowles out there. And Todd wow. Bowles was the starting safety on that team. And he did it. He started safety for a few years with the rest, with the Washington football team. Excuse me. So, <laughs> so we could go on and on, but I'm going to let you go. Could... was the OC in Tampa. Yeah, Tampa for that, for that one year. For that one wow. year. Just to draft Doug Williams. He was there for that one year. Wow. And he convinced them to draft Doug Williams. That's first incredible. black quarterback ever drafted in the first round. That's, yep. that's incredible. Now yep. – now that we've gotten, you know, now I always, of course, bring you on. We had to talk about, you know, that that your, your basketball coach at HD. Now, next time I bring you on, we're just going to talk D.C. sports history. That's all we're okay. going to talk. That <laughs> okay. right there. Um, for everybody who's listening, after you, after you listen to this one, that's the next one you want to listen to. That's the next TSDM podcast you want to listen to because that is oh, cool. going to just floor you at every <laughs> single minute. Trust me. Well, uh, Coach I love Lennon, it too, I appreciate you so, so much, man. I know you got practice coming up, so I'm going to yep. let you go, man. Um, appreciate before it. Before we get out of here, um, is that especially during this time, um, this uncertain time and challenging time of COVID and all that stuff? Yep. Um, is there anything that you want to, you know, share to student athletes who may be unsure about what the future holds um, for them as far as college and et cetera? Any, you know, any words of encouragement you want to share? Um, yeah, just just continue to, to persevere. I mean, the, the door is always going to be open if you mentally keep it open. You know, never, never close the door on yourself. No matter what the situation looks like now, um, you will still have an opportunity to be successful. And it might not be the path that you had envisioned, but it will lead to the ultimate goal. So uh, you might have to take an alternate route. You might have to go a different way. But when the when an obstacle like COVID and, you know, this uncertainty with college scholarships and things like that, when that hits you, um, don't stop. You know, find a way to go through it, around it, over it. You know, there's always more than one way to get to your destination. So don't close off any opportunity, no matter how small it may be. You know, you might have to take a year off. You might have to go to a junior college. You might have to, um, you know, work a little harder. You never know, but you will make it. And I've had coach kids that have had to do all those things. And so uh, just don't give up. Persevere. Don't give up. And keep chasing your dreams and good things will happen. I got to believe that. Have faith. Uh, believe in God. Amen. Yep. Amen. Well, Coach, Amen. that's yep. it for me, man. I appreciate you so much, man. I appreciate you.